You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Formerly, you're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Today, uh, we're going to talk about longevity, and we're going to talk about workouts tailored for hormones, and this thing that we all could have used more of over the last decade, but especially three years, what some people call resilience, uh, what I sometimes call equanimity, uh, which is that ability to choose your state and hold your state no matter what is happening in the world around you. You could call it grit, you could call it toughness, but toughness has a dark side that isn't in these other words. But you know, how do you bring it when it's hard? Our guest today, before I tell you who it is, uh, we, we share the same mission and uh, different paths for sure. <laughs> but it's helping people become better human beings, like better versions of you, the you that you choose to be versus the you that you feel like you don't have any control over being. Uh, he's a very well-known um, motivational speaker and author, and you might have read books like Bring It, Crush It, and The Big Picture. You probably have heard of uh, Beachbody Fitness or P90X. This is the creator of those, none other than Tony Horton. Tony, welcome. Dave, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. You did something that I actually wasn't going to expect, that I wasn't expecting you to do. And you decided to create a workout for women who are having a shifting hormonal cycle. And my first question for you is, you're a dude. <laughs> what would a dude know about these things? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And this was way off my radar. No question about it. And um, I had a podcast just like this with Dr. Mindy Pels. Yep. And, uh, you know, I've got a team of people and they're searching for good, good uh, interviews. And, you know, I did a little research on her and I found out who she was. And I thought this would be really fascinating. And her latest book, uh, Fast Like a Girl, is doing really well. She's done the circuit on the interviews with the morning shows. And it's had a huge impact on a lot of women, you know, because a lot of women uh, were exercising, but just struggling with it. You know what I mean? There were the ups and the downs. And, you know, some of them that were maybe ex-athletes had a certain pattern or process that they had, you know, they got back to and it was working for them. But for a lot of women who are, you know, busy and in their 30s, 40s and 50s and they've got kids and and it's just been a conundrum for them, right? So uh, when she did P90X and she did it, I think for five years in a row, I don't know why anybody would want to hear the same jokes over and over again, but, but <laughs> she really loved it. But what she did for herself, and she shared this with a lot of her fans and some of her friends and family, is she took the schedule that I created for both men and women and she switched things around based on her hormonal fluctuations. And so her results were infinitely better than she would have if she had followed the typical calendar that I created for both men and women. And we talked about this in the interview and I was kind mm -hmm. of blown away. And she said to me in the interview, she said, I want to create a program you not know, for men and women, but really, really hone what the schedule should be, how women need the ebb and flow of their their cycles, whether they're premenopausal, menopausal, or perimenopausal, whatever it is, based on all the work and research that she's done. And I said, I'm in. Yeah. We sat down and we had a lot of conversations and I, it was an eye opener for me. I, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest. I was completely unaware of the fact that, I mean, I always knew that women who did P90X, you know, they would have to modify on certain days. They would have to turn P90X into P120X. It was going to be a longer journey for them just based on the hormonal fluctuations. But I, that was the extent of my knowledge. But mm. really opened up the door to some new things. So we created stop options. So there were like a lot of the workouts are maybe 50 minutes long. You get to stop at the 20 minute mark. You get to stop at the 40 minute mark and fast forward to the, the cool down based on what your hormones are saying to you on your based on your age, whether you're in a, you know in the middle of bleeding or not. And and then we also had pretty specific powering up days and powering down days, mm. meaning depending on where you are in your cycle. Hey, today's, a, I don't know, you go, you're watching somebody else going for it, but that's not for you because we, we want you to feel like you have the energy and confidence to come back the following day. Wow. And I've got some hardcore gals, type A. They're like, man, I don't, I don't, I want to go for it, but she's telling me I got to mellow out. A friend of mine, Mary, who is here, she comes for Playa Wednesday night. She goes, this is the lowest weight I've ever been. And I've been doing, I've been working out uh, less intense doing more mindfulness practices and doing the types of workouts that I wouldn't normally be doing. And I'm just following the program. Yeah. She says, this is the lowest weight I've been. So Dr. Mindy Pels 
and I have created something that doesn't exist and we're proud of it. And we've had two test groups and the results, I know I sound like the infomercial right now, but, but it's, Heaven it's forbid. amazing to watch. It's <laughs> amazing to see gals, you know, for the first time, feel like they're doing something that feels right for them. They have energy, they're getting the recovery and they're seeing the results they want. It's an act of service um, to, to do this for women. I, a lot of people don't know this, but my first big book was a book on fertility for women. I, I studied women's hormones and fertility for five years because my wife at the time was infertile and we wanted to have kids and we restored fertility. And, and so I've always included uh, in, in my books, and Mindy and I have talked about this uh, on this show as well, you know, there's a, a chapter in my, my fasting book, you know, here's all the research that's specific to women. And even the reason that the publisher... Um, when they asked me to write a fasting book, I'm like I already wrote one. It's called the Bulletproof Diet, and it's like don't eat for a while. Like what's new? And well, what was new is that I was seeing that women in particular were over fasting. Some Type A guys do it, but we tend to handle a little bit better. Uh, but so many women couldn't lose weight because they were under eating, over fasting, over ketoing, and over training. Mm-hmm. And one of the criticisms that I've felt about P90X, I don't think I've ever kind of talked about it, was like you can overtrain. And so what you're, you're doing with a stop points, you're giving a little bit of motivation to push hard, but not push so hard that you break yourself. Mm-hmm. And the reality is that on average, women are better biohackers than men when they first start. And about 60% of my followers um, and customers are women. Uh, and it's because you, you have to customize it, but when you don't get... Uh, the, the separate information that's like, like, okay, should you fast longer or shorter based on this? And, you know, Mindy um, has run with that, you know, and did a whole book on it. And so I, I know that listeners of this episode, if they decide to try your new workout, um, where they're spacing it out based on how they feel, well, and again, this is a gross generalization. There are women who have no bodily awareness. But on average, if your body changes every month, you'll probably notice. And for guys, we don't. Um, and you know there there are changes for guys that that we ought to know about, but we don't. So I I think giving them guidance and permission to slow down at the right time is is honoring the the feminine nature of biology, and it creates happier, less anxious, um, leaner, more fit, and happier women when they don't overtrain. So thank you for working that in, and still you know hey push hard because if you can't push hard you're weak, but if you push so hard you become weak. It doesn't work either. So I'm, I'm right. stoked that you do this, and and I'm a dude too, right? So that, that was part of my question. Like yeah, people ask me that all the time. How can you write a fertility book? You're a cis white male, and I usually just say, actually, how do you know? You didn't even ask me, and then they go away. So, right. and yeah, I mean the adrenal burnout and the cortisol levels going through the roof, and and that's the reason why a lot of guys gals feel like well, this is just the wrong program for me. So they jump from one to the other to the other and they run into the same problems every time because they didn't know what Dr. Mindy knew. And it's, it, you know, it just felt like you're right. It's giving women permission to learn to do it a different way, you know, based on what's actually going on in their own personal body chemistry. And, uh, and we, we think it's groundbreaking. We're really excited and, and we're getting some great feedback. Uh, so this is, this is fun. And like with P90X, well, what I did was, you know, we had we had intensify, modify, but a lot of people are watching the person who's going for it, and they're not they're not even paying attention to the person who's modifying, and it's hard sometimes to make those judgment calls in the middle of a workout. You, you know, it's yeah. sort of like, yeah, he's going for it, I want to go for it. When in reality, you know, I look back at that program, and it, you know, we sold a lot of them, and a lot of people got great results. But if we had the intel then that I have now, maybe mm-hmm. we could even help more people. You know. Yeah, and it's it's time that we acknowledge that uh, men and women are not the same biologically. Even though most medical research from twenty plus years ago is just on you know young dudes because that's who was in college, yeah. and knowing these subtle differences and and even it actually hits women more than men. But if you didn't sleep much last night and you're highly jet lagged and you wake up in the morning, like is that the best time to go really hard? <laughs> <laughs> But it's on the schedule. It's on the schedule. It's supposed to be a, a, a you know an hour and ten minute plyo session. You know, like this morning, I got partway through my routine, and we were going hard. It was a bunch of guys all going after. We were all in a good mood, and I told them, I said, "Hey, in this last round, I'm backing off on reps, and I'm backing off on on the weight, just because it feels like I'm I maybe could get hurt here." But a lot of people don't have that little inner voice, 
yeah. men and women, and then they they wonder why they're you know always broken to some degree. It's funny as a as a young guy when I weighed three hundred pounds, uh, I went to the gym six days a week, ninety minutes a day without fail. Even if I only slept two hours, even if I had a sinus infection, probably wasn't the right thing to do. And I was restricting calories as much as I could and cutting fat and all that. And I didn't lose any weight after that time, but. I, I know that I overdrove myself because I didn't have that. So I, I feel like younger men are more likely to damage their biology um, first. And when women any time in life are overtraining, I think they, they get damaged more quickly than men. And mm-hmm. so just building these stop points in and saying, you know, this is the time you're most likely to, to do good. It's a real evolution. In fact, some of the comments from the live studio audience from the Upgrade Collective here, they're coming in and they're saying, you know, bravo for being willing to evolve. And, and you know, even for you, I don't think when you were you know, 29 years old, you would have said, you know, I, I'm going to take it a easy, do less reps. You'd be like, I am not going to do less reps because I'll be weak. And so yeah, your totally. wisdom also is showing. Totally, yeah. Yeah. Don't tell me. I know everything and to know. You know why? Because I'm successful. So because now I'm successful, I'm going to just compete, going to continue to keep doing the things that I that I know have worked. But look, I mean, I'm 65. So, you know, over the court and I got Ramsey Hunt syndrome about seven years ago, which completely kicked my ass. I mean, I, yeah, I want to talk with you about longevity. And I, I, no. I, this is a field where I've spent 20 years running a nonprofit and you know, written a major New York Times book on how to live to 180. But the thing that scares everyone is, Along the way, what if I get Alzheimer's? You know, what if I get a condition? So tell me about what you've got and what it was like to to acknowledge that this was happening. Well, it was stress related. I mean, I had chicken pox as a kid, so anybody who's had it has got that virus sitting in there, just waiting to come out when you're a little stressed out. So I, I went through some tough stuff. I I left Beachbody after 20 years. I was kind of shocked that they didn't want to really pay me anymore. That was weird, but it was a you know I'm riding this beautiful wave, and then the wave came to shore, and then I have to look over my shoulder and figure out what I'm going to do. So it was that added to the the stress. And then my longtime client, after 32 years, Tom Petty passes away the day after the Vegas shooting. And I just thought the world was caving in. Mm. And uh, I was a lot more ornery than I even knew. You know, it's like the frog in the frying pan thing. My cortisol levels, I'm sure, were through the roof. My adrenal glands were fried. And then all of a sudden, I felt this burning in my ear. And of course, if you're going to get shingles, the last place you want it is in your ear because you've got the I think it's the fifth, sixth, seventh facial nerves that affect your balance, your sight, your smell, and your taste, and um, goes straight into the brain. And so, you know, I mean, I I couldn't turn my head without vomiting. I couldn't get out of bed. My Epstein Bar was a twelve. You know what I mean? I had leaky gut, leaky nice. brain. I had all these things that were happening, and I'm the guy that's supposed to be, you know, Johnny Health and Fitness. And I wasn't. And I didn't have a mindfulness practice. My mindfulness practice was, you know, turning Zeppelin all the way up for about twenty. It's a pretty you know, good one. I, I'm not going to argue with it. It's a good it. one. I still use that <laughs> one. That's not one to go. I got 10. I got 10. And I look at it on a piece of paper and I go, Eni, what do I need right now? I didn't have this list of 10 before. And I read, you know, I read John Kabat-Zinn's book, Full uh, Catastrophe Living, which saved my life. Because mm-hmm. all the king's horses and all the king's men, they tried what they could. I had Bell's palsy. Like, you know, that's not good on camera, right? So I, I had some real things I had to deal with. And it took a long time. It took about a year before I could at least appear normal and function. Um, still to this day, I have something called bilateral vestibular hypofunction, which is a form of vertigo. And those nerves mm-hmm. have yet to heal seven years later. But, you know, I do what I can do. And I have a regular meditation practice. It's I do a lot of body scan meditation. I do a lot of box breathing. And mm-hmm. it wasn't easy to come back from. But I had this base of, of healthy eating, regular exercise. But I had to add the mindfulness component. And I had been vegan which I still am for the most part. I'm a part-time vegan now. If there's elk, medall- elk medallions on a menu in Jackson Hole, I'm going to eat them. You know, if there's wild salmon, I'm going to eat it. So, so, so what, why don't you just say you're an omnivore like everyone else? A part-time vegan. Yes, I guess vegan. I don't want to label it. I guess because I'll eat <laughs> vegan for for seven weeks in a row, and then I'm in Jackson Hole and then I'll have some elk. So I don't I don't know what. Maybe give me a good. How should I label myself? I'm not sure. I, I would say that. You're an omnivore. Like you can eat a little meat or a lot of meat, but if you know, it, it, it's there sort of like go. like we've put the vegan thing up on a pedestal. In my case, it made me very ill after uh, mm. about a year, year and a half of it. And I've interviewed dozens of medical doctors and top people who've had the same thing happen because of oxalic acids and things. So there's no moral value to eating more or less meat. But like if you eat some meat, you're not vegan. Most of the vegans who never eat any meat. Man, they do not age well. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing yeah. to know. Yeah, I mean, I 
I, I tried veganism twice and it went terribly bad. Yeah. And then when I went, you know, I went through my blood test and I met with the endocrinologist and nutritionist and I had to cut out so many things just to heal my gut and heal everything right. else. And it ended up being vegan like, but I didn't have a decent protein source. So I met with some folks and I made my own, you know, I mean, I have yeah. massive doses of HMB and vitamin D3, put that in the protein and like, oh, and now as a guy who's 65, I, I feel like I can still charge you're, and lift and work. So you're looking pretty good. So the, the one thing you're doing, obviously, is you're getting enough protein which is really hard to do as a vegan unless you package it with, you know, a thousand grams of carbs a day. So if you're doing yeah. industrially separated out uh, plant proteins, you're getting your protein levels up, which helps so much. I mean, you, yeah. yeah. How, how are you doing on the, the chicken pox virus thing? Is, is it gone? You're just healing from the damage? Is, are you done with the viral infection or does it keep coming back? It's there. It'll always be there. You know, there's nothing it's I can want, do about it. Shingles you want some biohacking back. about that? That this may be not yeah, in medical Maybe literature? I could do some help there, but I haven't had any issues in seven years. Okay, so it's been gone for seven years. Seven years. I mean, right, I used to have to put, I had all kinds of inflammation everywhere. I used to put yeah. PRP and symbiosis on my knees. I don't need that anymore. <laughs> Me too, um, man. You know what I mean? Like, oh my God, like, oh, what's that? $1,500 a knee. That's a little expensive every time I needed it. So, I mean, it seems that right now I'm in pretty good balance. And I think mostly because I've learned to chill out. I've learned to. There you go. It, if you can't do that. And, you can take every nootropic out there, every protein powder, but if you can't chill out, you're still not going to thrive. And uh, I, I've seen you chill out over the course of your career remotely. I mean, we don't know each other super well, um, but you know, I, I'm I'm aware of your work in the world, and and you you can sort of see the wisdom has come in. Right? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk for a minute about uh, the chickenpox virus and other pox viruses. Uh, this includes herpes. I had high EBV count, I had toxic mold, I had Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, leaky gut, um, arthritis, all this before I was 30. And so I, I had to learn from my elders at an anti-aging group. That's why I know about longevity. And one of my favorite mentors is a guy named Steve Folks, who's been on the show a few times, biochemist. And he wrote a book called Cure Herpes with BHT. And BHT is a synthetic antioxidant used to protect oils. And what they found in the 80s, many of the longevity people who were planning to live to 180, like me, um, they were using this to keep their, their membranes in their body from oxidizing, just to protect the fats in your body. It turns out all of the viruses that are lipid encapsulated, including chickenpox and all forms of herpes and EBV, they cannot replicate when BHT is present in the body. So for something that costs about a dollar for a month's supply, you can absolutely stop these viruses from replicating. And I have helped dozens of friends with shingles. It comes on, they use BHT topically, they use it orally, about 300 milligrams, and it goes away. And some people say, but it's an endocrine disruptor. At lower doses it is, but who cares if you disrupt your endocrines a little bit if you stop shingles? I know that if you had that biohack at the height of your problems, the Bell's palsy would have gone away way hmm. faster than it did. And part of my mission is to spread this kind of knowledge. And that's unpopular. I mean, there's expensive drugs that you're supposed to take. This is something anyone can do. And I talk about this occasionally on the show. And if you know you do have shingles, or even if someone in your family gets chicken pox, you can give it to them and they'll have a mild case and they'll stop replicating and everything dries up in three days. And it's very reliable. So I want mm. every functional medicine doctor, find the book. It's free online. The guy's name is Steve Folks, F-O-W-K-E-S. And the book is Cure Herpes with BHT. And Big Pharma hates it. But because of your condition, you need to have a bottle of BHT in your cabinet in case you get a tingle that comes back. Knock that shit down. I mean, Tony, <laughs> you got to know. This is where biohacking is important. Right on. I mean, I feel like I'm very lucky. You know, I keep thinking seven years, eight years, how far will I, you know, like what, if there's ever a stressful event that comes up, I mean, I know what that'll do to me. And I'm just, yeah, like I said, oh, okay. Like there's a lot of things where I used to go yeah. nuts and I don't anymore. I go, this, you know, this does not serve me, this kind of reaction. Uh, and it comes in my family. I got, a, I got, we got some I, uptight Hortons in the family. In the history. Yeah. So, it is so a you, lot you did the deep work to turn that down. And, and what I find too is, is that oftentimes guys who live at your volume, you know, you, you do a lot of stuff. You got big businesses and you're just out there. Um, when you travel around the world and you get like physically exhausted and all that, that's when stuff flares up. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've learned is that 
I can take a little bit of bioidentical cortisol, which is something old weightlifters used to do. It's very safe to do this. But if you're right on the edge of crashing and you're like, I'm probably mm. going to get a cold, you take that for a day. It's like five milligrams of Cortef four times a day. And magically, your body has enough power to stop the inflammation so it doesn't start. And, and that's been something I've taught people to use for jet lag and all. Uh, but I'm like, man, I don't want you ever to have another flare up. And I would be honored. I'll make sure you have my cell phone number. If it happens again, you call me. I, I will tell you the biohacks that are not on most menus. And we can stop it right as it's starting. And mm. that, those are just a couple things. But man, I, I want you to have longevity and the benefits of biohacking so that you can be calm and peaceful and you can still bring it like for the next hundred years. Yeah, I mean, my number is 109, but I like your number better. Um, Wait, I, why know, is it 109? I mean, like, why not 108 or 110? I don't know. Like, like, one, 110 seems really old. Um, but it's interesting. You know, a lot of my peers, people, my, people I went to high school and college with, I mean, I went back east, which is where I'm from, Rhode Island, Connecticut. And I looked around and I went, how come everybody my age looks like my grandparents? It's, it's kind of shocking. And you just watch the behavior and there's lack of movement. And there's tons of stress and yeah. a lot of family issues and work issues and lack of activity. And just you sit down and just watch one meal and think, I could never eat. That would kill me. That meal would kill me. And people just do that day in and day out. And you can kind of see why they're getting so haggard. Um, so, you, yeah, you can, I, and, by the way, I appreciate some of these tips. I've been writing them down. So I really do appreciate that. And anything. And I, I like, to, I'm a curious guy. If, if something doesn't work, I'll change on a dime. I, I'm not so addicted yeah. to old behavior, right? That, uh, that's, a, that's a quality that it, so, so few people develop until you know, they've taken some hits. When did you learn to be flexible like that? A little bit prior to Ramsey Hunt, but certainly after. That was, that was my kick in the teeth that made me understand. And also the woman I'm married to. My wife is, is a special lady. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there were a lot of days during Ramsey Hunt where I was just, you know, lying there with my head in her, in, in her lap sobbing because the, the pain and the anguish and the depression was pretty high. And, you know, where is, I, I, here's the, here it is, man. It's always nearby. And I, you know, that book did wonders for me. You can even see where I, where I Tell me the name of the book for people who aren't watching. Oh, uh, Full Catastrophe Living. Full Catastrophe Living, Using the Wisdom of Your Body and Mind to Face Stress, Pain, and Illness by John Kabat-Zinn. I tell you, I pull that out all the time and just go, oh yeah, here's a reminder. You know, and it, well, it's you're... joy and laughter. And a lot of it has, for me, it has to be with communing with, with like-minded people who are just fun to be with. And we laugh hard and we play hard and we chill hard, which I never used to do. And that's really made the difference for me. And, and constantly getting blood work and looking to see where I need to make adjustments for my, with my diet and my supplements and everything else if, and my meds, you know, so. so if you could look and feel and think and have the amount of energy you have today at 120, would you change your number? Yeah, hell yeah. Oh yeah, my I, goodness. It, it's happening. I've looked at all the tech. I'm about to go do... Uh, a very highly advanced gene therapy that'll probably take about 11 years off my already low epigenetic age. Mm. And I've, you know, I, I age at 79% the rate of an average person. Uh, and it's probably a lower rate of aging now based on some interventions. But Tony, there's no reason you can't be the Tony of today, two or three decades from now. Because mm. life it, is too fun to, to have it all end yeah. too soon. And here's the thing too, though. And I, I don't know, this is the way I think. And maybe maybe this is the reason why things are going pretty well for me these days is I don't think in terms of longevity. I think in, in terms of quality of life today. Yeah. And that kind of that. builds up and over time. I mean, I, I was skiing in Jackson Hole last year, some of the deepest snow I've ever skied in. And I mean, I prepare myself all year to, for those long trips. I'm there for all of January, part of February. I'll be there in December. I'll be there in March. I go up to Mammoth as well. And I was skiing as hard, as fast as I ever had, top to bottom. There's this one run where I used to have to stop. You know, even when I was fit, P90X guy, I have to stop twice. Oh, <gasps> tired. Oh, <gasps> so <gasps> tired. <laughs> you know what I mean? And this one trip, I saw that spot where I stopped and I kept going. I'm like, ooh. And then I went to the second stop. I go, oh, I'll have to stop there. And I went, I did some mindfulness, little box breathing part way down. And I went all the way to the bottom and I looked up and I saw my two friends. I'm like, I didn't, this was, this, I was 63 at the time. Wow. And it's been that way ever since, you know, and I couldn't do that in my, 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. I mean, you know as well as anybody. It's just a blast to keep moving through time and not noticing what a lot of people are struggling with. It's it's pretty fun. And to be able to share that with folks, 
like you and I do. Mm -hmm. I mean, my purpose is to help other people find theirs through, you know, through this lifestyle. Uh, well, having a, a regular practice, whether you're talking meditation or, or exercise, you've, you've helped so many people do that. You mentioned something earlier about how Mindy, you did P90X for five years and, and, and all this. And you said, well, yeah, how do you listen to the jokes over and over? You've been successful at working out like, like a madman for most of your life, but so many people get started and then they stop. What is the trick for people who are listening to have a consistent practice for years? Three things plus one. Purpose, plan, accountability, with a little bit of intensity as you progress and track your progress. So purpose is, I think a lot of reasons why people struggle is because the reason why sucks. It's too much about their ego. It's too much about the aesthetics. It's too much about how they think they're perceived by other people. Right. So it's all about, you know, bigger arm, like how much you bench and how much you squat. What's your circumference of your arms or how cute is your bu- booty? And it's not sustainable because life keeps happening. Right. There's all these, you know, whatever it's work, it's family, it's stress, it's traffic. Da, da, da. And any little thing will knock you off track because your purpose sucks. Yeah. I train hard because I have other things outside of exercise that I really want to do and love to do. And so I train for that. I also train because I understand that the, I'm going to release norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, brain drive, neurotropic factor, no matter what I do, whether I go for a walk, whether I do an hour and a half yoga, whether I lift weights, especially when I'm doing martial arts or cardio stuff, this is that, right? The temporal lobe, the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus lights up like a Christmas tree mm-hmm. and it changes my perspective for the rest of the day. That one hour affects the 23. And, you know, that's just science and fact. And anybody who understands like, oh, it's really about, if I train now, then I can go to Italy and I can get on a bike and ride five and a half hours on the Appian Way where Caesar used to go, as opposed to other people who look at it from their car. You know what I mean? Or I can go skiing with friends of mine that are half my age and fly down that mountain <laughs> with snow going over my shoulders. Like, that's why I train. And I also train because I'm naturally sort of a depressed person. I'm a quiet, depressed person. <laughs> you wouldn't think so. But no, I, I get my... I get in my head. If I miss two or three days, I'm not a really good guy to hang out with. I am using myself as the source as opposed to outside sources, drugs, alcohol, you know, porn, whatever your thing is, weed, you know, I am the source. It's already there. And I have these, you know, short term exercise leads to a lifetime of, of joy, happiness and pleasure. You know, those little bouts with, you know, short term pleasures lead lead to a, a miserable life and a, and a shorter life. So that's purpose. And I, when mm. I get that across to people, oh shit, if I work out today, yeah, I'm not going to weigh any less. I'm not going to look different in the mirror, but I'm a better person for it. And it's not really about me. It's about who I am with my, how I affect other people in my life. Like my friends and my family, like, oh man, you, I can tell you've been consistent because you're just, I'm more thoughtful. I'm more patient. I'm more altruistic. You know what I mean? I'm more creative. I mean, and that happens right away. You don't have to wait for how you look. Another one is a plan. You got to write down where you, what you're going to do, when you're going to do it. I mean, I everybody knows on Monday, Saturday is my only day off, but Monday through Friday and Sunday, it's scheduled. It's in the books. Everybody that, that I work for, everybody that I know is don't get in the way of those workouts. And, and accountability for me is, is making sure that I've always got somebody over here. I mean, I've got four different places to work out. I got a ninja course. I got a 20 foot rope with parallel bars. I got another, uh, pegboard down there with a rope and a bell and everything else. So I'm always on the horn, reaching out to people, come and play. Like this morning, there were five of us. Uh, last night, there were nine of us. And so- uh, So you've you got community. Come, community. The community I mean, is people, how you're doing it. Okay. That's how I do it. And then last but oh. not least, I track who I am. I track what I'm doing. Some days are maintenance days. Yeah, I'm not moved, but I'm here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Other days, oh, I got a couple more reps in or I feel a little bit stronger. I was able to get up that rope you know, a little bit quicker. Those things make it happen for me. The tracking part of, of it is really core to biohacking. It's like, I just want to do what works, right? Mm-hmm. And if it's not working, I'm going to change it because I spent so much time doing stuff that didn't work. And, and it's kind of like your, your newest program. Like, you know what? For women at a certain point, you know, let's put in stop points because it works better. It's, it's like, do something, measure, test, try something. And, and eventually everything evolves and improves if someone's motivated you're keeping your dopamine levels high 
with with your you know your intense uh, longer workouts and even the community exposure raises dopamine mm-hmm. and you've noticed because you track it huh if i don't get that for 3 days my dopamine drops and i'm a curmudgeon i don't like my life and yeah, yeah i end up with yeah. exercise bipolar disorder and I, you know i know what that feels like so yeah you're exactly do, right. do you do cold plunging at all cuz that's another dopamine I thing i just that got like. one and yeah. um, i've done it in the past i've been up to uh, i'm name dropping now but i got i was on um uh, Gabby Reese's podcast up at her I house. I love Gabby. Home. She's so fun. She's yeah. just the best, man. And then her and Laird were there. Hey, you got to come to the house. So I went through the whole pool workout and got in the hot box and got in the ice plunge. And, uh, you know, this this was me in the car on the way. Oh, like, holy smokes, you know. But what a phenomenal day. And so I, I knew about it. I'd done it once or twice. But listening to those two and how important it is, mine is maybe four weeks old. Uh, and it said it. <clears throat> 60 degrees. I apologize for those of you, the hardcores that got it down in the thirties, but that's just, that's, I can get out on a ski slope at, at minus 20 and go, I got all the right gear on, but, uh, you know, getting in that thing in my boxer shorts is, is a little rough for me, but I'm, I'm in there and I do my three minutes and it's, it's done wonders. It's just going to take a while for me to get, to get. Oh, it, it's, it's another grit practice, uh, like, like a, being able to push hard in a different way with similar dopamine effects. And I, mm-hmm. I prefer the ones with cold air. We're doing that at Upgrade Labs, opening franchises all over the place. Oh, wow. Uh, by the way, listeners, go to ownandupgradelabs.com if you want to be a franchisee and open a business. And you know, it's one of the different things. But I, I found that for me, with the mental acuity and happiness levels, I can exercise and it helps. And if I cold plunge, I, I really get a big boost. You just want to cold plunge and then exercise because if you cold plunge after the exercise, the exercise doesn't work. And that's something well, that uh, right we that just down. figured out. Oh my God, because that's exactly what I've been doing. You know, just to kind of yeah. bring all the inflammation down. So, um, so yeah. if you if you overtrain, you can use cold to stop the damage. But if you get cold in the plunge and then you get out, you say, "But I need to warm up." Well, your body will warm up, but it's teaching your cells to create heat is actually where the benefit comes from metabolically. So then. Exactly. You're going to start a little slow, but the heat comes on quickly. And the faster the heat comes on, the better your metabolism. And then as long as you don't like exercise to the point of almost injuring yourself, the inflammation is good for you because now you've got heat that the body made, which also means it made power. And then the power adapts to what caused the inflammation, and then you grow muscles. And the studies, the most recent ones are showing ice exposure after exercise reduces muscle growth. Right? Nice. What do so you I'm, know? I'm, I'm working on all the algorithms and we're using AI now um, mm. in order to figure out what to do in what order to get the best results. And that one I'm very sure of. And that's from eight years of running you know, the biohacking upgrade labs under Arnold Schwarzenegger's office in Santa Monica, right? It's just you get enough experimental data. You're like, oh, this works better. Right? So there's a hack for you that could be helpful. Thank you. That's you, awesome. You got it. Yeah, yeah, and great. I'm just so intrigued at how you're evolving your knowledge and your programs and uh, and even yourself, and you look fantastically healthy. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I haven't had alcohol in 35 years. Uh, I've been dealing with my stress really well for the last seven. There's some genetics in there for me, you know, but it's also behavior and environment. I've been extremely consistent for a very long time, and I'm very good at making adjustments along the way and making change along the way. You know, do I run as fast as I used to? No, but I, I can do a ninja course now like a teenager, which I couldn't even begin to do because I didn't have the hand and forearm strength. You know what I mean? So certain areas are getting better. Certain areas, areas I don't focus on as much because I get more injury. I get on a track and I start running fast. If I don't do like an hour warm up, then that simple hundred is going to blow out both my hamstrings. So I, you know, I just tone down where I need to. I'm just listening because I don't want to be hurt. Oh. So far, so good. And and the consistency aspect of it, that alone, you know, whoever, Woody Allen, 80% of life is showing up. And the other 20%, in my opinion, is paying very close attention to what's happening while you're in the middle of what you're doing. It's like, duh. You know, but, you know, when I was 25, that's, you know, I've got a bunch of boneheads around me and trying to bench press it or blowing out both my shoulders. I don't do that. You know, you know uh, the fact that you're willing to say, look, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to run because it doesn't work for me. Kudos. It, it seems like some people have, I think it's based on the 1970s thing, like a moral thing. Like if you run, you're a good person. And I did this when I was overweight. Plus you lose weight. And I had arthritic knees and, you know, my feet didn't have the right, uh, just the right musculature, the right programming. I, I didn't know how to move them right from a functional movement perspective. So I was causing all kinds of damage. And I finally just realized, you know what? 
as a former 300 pound, now 200 pound guy, probably running isn't my sport because of the whole thing called physics. And so I still feel like a little bit of a a twinge where like I I interviewed Jocko uh, on stage. And Jocko Willing, this guy, you know, I'm up at 4.30 and I sweated on my watch. And, or, you know, David Goggins, I, I ran 10,000 miles before lunch. And I'm like, how do you do that? Because biologically, it doesn't matter how tough I am. I know that I am going to need knee replacements when I'm 147 or something if I keep doing that. <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm like, I'm going to choose the things that work for me. And there is no goodness or badness for, for doing it. And I have so much respect for, you know, their grit and determination and so for listeners, you've also adapted this idea for yourself personally and even in your newest program. You're like, okay, like it's okay to say this is enough for me today. And I didn't give myself permission as a young man to, to say this is enough because if, if you're not enough, whatever you're doing won't be enough. And that's the deep work you've done as well. So I, you're, you're well, and for so me, much. like if I'm not going to do this anymore, I've got to replace it with something else. So, I mean, the last bicycle I had was like a 10 speed from the seventies. And I just never, I didn't buy it. I had rollerblades. I did other, I skied, I, you know, whatever. Um, I did a little bit of surfing here and there. And I thought, what's something that I can do all the time that I really enjoy that's less pounding. So I went out and got a really good mountain bike. Then I got another really good one. And I got a third one, you know what I mean? Three different kinds of bikes for three different kinds of surfaces. And now you can go, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles and come home feeling great. You know, I mean, obviously you got the heart, lungs and legs that are working and, and you get to see more, cover more ground. You know, you get good shocks uh, on the bike and, and it's just mm-hmm. 1,020 calories later, you know, you've Jackson Hole. When you go to Jackson Hole, just the, the single track, whatever, just riding our bikes into town or into Teton National Park with my wife. It's just an amazing experience. And we cover, you know, like I said, we cover more ground, see more things. And we, we come back unscathed, which is key now. You're, uh, you're also getting nature therapy when you do that too, which also we know that makes you live longer, makes you happier. So you, you've evolved practices in your life so that you've built some happiness in. What percentage of the time would you say you're genuinely happy? Oh, I love that question. I wish it were more. <laughs> I wish it were more because I'm happy addicted. I mean, it's in the damn constitution, Dave, the pursuit of happiness. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm working out hard. All, all my workout buddies are actors and comics, mostly, right? They're just funny people. They can turn a phrase. Mm-hmm. They're just great company. We're always, you know, kind of busting each other up a little bit. Uh, that's part of it. My wife is hilarious. Mm-hmm. I did stand up for two years and I was with Second City LA for a year. You know, when I had a, when I was a C minus student with a speech impediment and I was a target at school at the bus stop, no matter what, um, humor was my only way to get out of trouble. So I love making people laugh and I love laughing hard. I watch a lot of comedy specials, you know, I mean, I, I understand the importance of laughter and, and, the, and there's the more dopamine again, but um, yeah, I, I would say it's every day. I laugh hard several times a day because of some, something somebody else said or something I saw or something my wife has said to me the other day when Rhode Island at my buddy's wedding and, and I, you know, I'm in Rhode Island there for 10 days and I'm not eating as clean as I should. You know, but uh, I look in a two-way mirror and I go, oh my God, honey, what is this? And she goes, oh, those are chunks. I go, chunks? What's a chunk? And she goes, I don't know, but it's that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> really, really little thing. I go, oh my God, I got chunks now. She's been making up turns for my my obliques. And that's that's part of my, I think my, why I look the way I do, the way that I feel the way I do, the way, you know, the way I haven't dealt with any sort of shingles in seven years. Um, it's the joy and the laughter. And the, and the mindfulness practices too, that, that combination and the working hard and eating clean. I mean, it's, uh, you, you know, as well as I do. And you, in the hacking part, there's still some, there's a lot of room for growth for me there. And I, I appreciate some of the stuff that you shared with me today. Uh, some of the stuff that, that when you just look at data and say, I'm going to do the stuff that's not supposed to work. So I tried everything that was supposed to. And then I said, I'll, I'll try the stuff that seems stupid. Right. And <laughs> if it works dramatically, okay, I, I guess I had an assumption about reality that was wrong. And I do my best to share it. And sometimes it's frustrating. And, you know, it's frustrating because people are like, well, that can't be. I'm like, well, how much data do you need? And you could try it for a week and see if I'm lying. But then I, I, I can't try that. And it's a, the same thing with, you know, okay, people say, I, I could never do P90X. I can never, like, well, have you ever tried? I'm like, no. Well, okay. You don't know that you can't do something until you prove you can't do it. And probably you could have done it. You just already convinced yourself you couldn't. 
Yeah. And that's, that's just history and culture and yeah. surrounding yourself with the wrong kind of people. And you know what I mean? All the naysayers and finger pointers are still in your life. You got to clear that out and get the new tribe. I mean, if you look at P90X, for example, I mean, I don't know, 11 million copies to date, something like that. I don't know what the number is, but a lot of people who, there were so many things in there that if we known that I know now we could have, like I said, got more people involved. Jeremy Yost, uh, 300 plus pounds, fused right ankle from a football accident from high school. Um, there was no shot he was going to live past 60 because he was grossly obese. He bought P90X, which is not, wasn't designed for him. And he marched in place for the first month and a half, just, wa just watching it and learning. And then 180 pounds later and three rounds later, uh, he's on tour with me all over Europe and, and Asia, you know, being a madman on stage. Just because he was patient with it, he kept his expectations down. He just was he for the first part of it. He was just in a learning mode. Like he was just sitting at watching, like he was watching a TV show. You know what I mean? Just standing there, bringing his knees to his hands. And you think to yourself, "Kudos to you, brother! Like way to hack this thing to the point where." And they go, "Oh, I think I can do this move now." And he would try two or three reps. Amazing, amazing story to see how far he came, um, just because he said yes. It, it's that belief thing, and having a belief you can do it, or a belief you can live longer too. It helps. And you you mentioned something else that that I think is underappreciated in the longevity circles, because it's it's not cool and it's not sexy. It's not tech. It's not grit. Uh, it's the value of humor. And I <laughs> I sometimes open up a talk. I'll say, well, you know, if the calendar says I'm fifty. The lab tests say I'm 39 or maybe 24, depending what lab test you like. I don't think I would look like I'm 24, but my arteries apparently are. And, and they say, but my real metric is I still have my seventh grade sense of humor. And I make the dumbest jokes. I think it keeps you younger, either that or it makes everyone else around you older. But either way, I, maybe you're sucking the youthfulness out of them with dumb jokes. So I'm going to keep doing it. Um, and the people who lose their sense of humor, they get old and angry quickly. Yeah, right? dude. Yeah, I mean, you know, I always I make a joke. Like, uh oh, you know, I found that I might be suffering from early onset curmudgeon disorder. Early onset curmudgeon disorder can lead to uh, chronic curmudgeon disorder. But then again, if you just keep on keeping on with that lame behavior and that bad company and those myopic opinions, up, oh, it's terminal curmudgeon disorder. Get off my lawn. And, you know what I mean? Your sphere of friends are smaller and smaller. You know, I think the other thing too that that I don't think we've talked about is, like, I've got I've got a massive group of, of friends. You mm -hmm. know, there was a guy walking down the street one day. I was delivering some of my protein powder to my neighbor because he let me stay at his place in Mammoth, and this guy was like hovering. You know, he was like, "Uh oh, oh, we got my got my another stalker coming," and he just mm -hmm. came up and said, "Hey, you saved my career." I got, and he tells me why because he had a fused right shoulder and and there was a, a rehab stuff that he was doing. Uh, I, I'm on tonal, so he was doing that. And he, he turns out he's the head of the gang unit here for the FBI in LA. You know what I mean? And this fascinating guy who's just walking down the street is one of my dearest friends. I'm always open because like you, I, just spending whatever time we're going to spend, an hour plus, a lot of people are so close-minded. They don't have new friends. All the friends that they have are starting to die off or aren't doing anything mm -hmm. anymore. And they're looking, you know, they're looking through an, a buttonhole at their life and they can't figure out why they went from early uh, onset curmudgeon disorder to terminal. And it's just about being fearless in these simple areas. Like, how can you laugh more? How can you search out new people who can maybe not maybe necessarily teach you something? Maybe some of them will, but a lot of them are just great company and you learn from them. I mean, I've learned so much about, about uh, his job and his career. And now he's stationed in London. He's got this really amazing job in London. And before, and I said, hey, we're going to London. He goes, let me connect you with these five people. And our experience in London was completely different because a stranger was walking down the street and said, hello. You know, and by the way, if you're ever in London, you got to go to the Cinnamon Club, Dave. You don't know what cinnamon that is. Club. What, what's the Cinnamon Club? It's a restaurant. It's, a, it's an Indian restaurant like you have never Ooh, sounds tasted. Good. I mean, it's not regular Indian. If you love Indian food, you will love this 10 times more. It's crazy. And so, you know, one more thing he turned me on to. And I've turned like five other people who've also the, the Cinnamon Club's insane. Well, you know, it's an you old probably just turned another. Uh, th there'll be a wait to get in for a while after this interview. Yeah, yeah, so. with your fan base. It, the food there is, is my wife and I, best food we've ever had in our life. Wow. Okay. I, uh, next time I'm in London, I'm absolutely putting on my list. It's interesting, too. Uh, you, you mentioned friends from all over the place. Um, when I was in my 20s, one of the most powerful things I did that helped me be who I am and, and get where I am today. Uh, I ended up getting a bunch of friends who were in their 70s and 80s and 90s because 
I went to the anti-aging group where all the old people were getting young. Mm. And like I'm going to a friend's 80th birthday in, in October. Uh, one of the guys behind uh, the book, The Secret. And having friends who are in their 70s and 80s and you know, when you're middle-aged, having friends in their 20s and, and 30s, it's, it keeps you young and flexible. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you mentioned what the tribe used to look like when you lived in 150 people. You always had some elders and some young people to pick up heavy things. And like, that's just kind of how it worked. Right. And if, if you lose that in your life, I feel like you age more quickly, but you're less happy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this morning, for example, everybody was younger than me. You know, some only by about five years. Others were, you know, in their th- early 30s. You know, my buddy Bobby and I were the elders, you know, what I mean? and then we had the youngsters. And then collectively, we just found different ways to sort of inspire and motivate each other in that workout. Now, if none of them had showed up and I was there by myself, it would have been a completely different experience. For, for the most part, I probably would have gone through the motions. It would have been more of a maintenance routine, which would have been fine. I would have come out unscathed. I got to say, I'm a little beat up right now. So, so you know, I'm going to break out the foam roller later. I'll probably take a little nap or something based on what, what I went through. Um, but it was just, you know, it was just more mm-hmm. fun. It was just more inspiring. <laughs> and, and we had a blast. And it was tons of laughter because it's a fun group of guys, you know. So. Do you ever pull all-nighters? No. No, no. Yep. I'm, a, I'm a professional sleeper, man. And uh, I keep I keep a Tom Petty schedule, which is not healthy for me. If there's one area that I'm I can't be consistent with, it's my sleep because I know that that's you know you're, for me it's my number one recovery. When I get nine hours, mm-hmm. I, mean, I can conquer the world. But a lot of times it's maybe six and a half, seven, and I feel like I'm kind of struggling a little bit. But no, I've never stayed up. So so your you so your sleep hygiene's okay. It just doesn't sound like it's terrible or fantastic either i Mm -hmm. i don't as a general rule do it and sometimes i'll stay up late when i'm writing books there's like a magic hour between like 11 p.m and 2 or 3 a.m but i'm changing my lights to be red it looks like i'm in a submarine and i I, it doesn't seem to hurt me but i pulled an all-nighter at burning man just because i want to see the sunrise and Mm -hmm. yeah i was less of uh, less of a happy person the next day even though i slept right so but you know, you're such a high energy guy. I kind of imagine that 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 might well, have been I think maybe inadvert- inadvertently I have because I you know I've been to about 63 military bases around the world. It's been I'm working with the Pentagon and the AFE, which is also known as Armed Forces Entertainment. Here I'll show you a little something. Those are all the challenge coins. Wow. What's yeah, a whole wall of challenge coins? Whole wall of challenge coins, man. There's I don't know 300, 400 on that wall, um, and it's just been like you know you fly from here to to Tokyo, Tokyo to Okinawa, and then you've got a 7 a.m. call time, which I don't know what the hell time it was back in L.A., and then they put you on an F-15C and they fly you at the speed of sound and, and whatever. So there's been times where maybe I've gotten some sleep here and there, but yeah, especially traveling to Europe back and forth. You know, there's I've been sleep deprived, and like you say, you know, I don't function very well under those conditions, but a lot better than I used to. You know, when I used to fly around a little bit, um, I was... I was knackered. And now because of my lifestyle, it doesn't doesn't slam me as much as it used to. I can so, so you're more resilient that way than before. Yeah, absolutely. There's something that you've talked about in your your videos that maybe 20 years ago I would have thought, you know, that sounds like a lot of a lot of bullshit. Uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it probably it, it might have been a little bit. Might have been. It, it's muscle confusion. Well, it's a made up term. We made that term yeah. up. Yeah. But and, and Billy, Billy it, Idol, I trained Billy. Billy used to call yeah. me Muscle Confucius. And the CEO mm. <laughs> thought that was funny. He goes, let's call it Muscle Confusion. I go, what? It's just, you know, I mean, uh, Jack Lane had periodization training. Yeah. Muscle Confusion. And even Arnold likes to give me crap for that. You know what I mean? I, like it, muscle confusion I, I think it's actually brilliant. Now that I know what I know about the brain and neural adaptation and some of the, the latest science in, in how to create change in biological systems. What the idea is, is that if you change your workout routine regularly, your body won't adapt and you'll continue to grow. Maybe there's something about individual body parts adapting, but I think the genius of it is what it does for your brain. Right? Because exercise makes the brain better. And mm-hmm. when you do exercise that is uncomfortable for the brain because it, it didn't just do that, it makes the brain stronger. It makes myelin sheath thicker, and it's one of the reasons that you know I'll, I started playing uh, ping pong 
Uh, my mm-hmm. my dear friend, uh, Dr. Daniel Amen from Amen Clinics, I'm on his board of directors now after years after he helped me without knowing me. Uh, he said, Dave, get a ping pong table. I said, all right. And the idea there is you're going over here, you're crossing over the center line, and some people call it cross-training, but you were an early adopter, uh, whether you kind of made it up or not, but I think it creates anti-aging neurological effects in the brain to not do the same thing every day. Well, it yeah. comes down to the, the boredom and injuries and plateaus that stop most people in their tracks, right? So, right. Yeah. So, I mean, if, you're, if there's a lot of variety there, it's like, oh, this is more interesting than just, you know, I mean, the old days I would do, you know, chest and back for two hours and I'd get on the stationary bike for 45 minutes. And then I would do legs the next day and get on the bike for 45 minutes and I'd do shoulders and arms and get on the bike. And so when I was training all these rockers, you know, like Billy Idol and Tom Petty, Bruce Springsteen, mm-hmm. I was like, we got to get a heavy bag. We got to get, you know, we got to do Pilates. We got to do yoga because, you know, they, they got tours to get ready for and they've got, you know, fancy lifestyles. And, and they liked that. And it, I noticed it was working for me in the gym. Oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do yoga today. I'm going to do Pilates today. I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the, the aerobics room because that's where all the women are, you know, and it was a, regardless of the reason why, uh, and then I just want to pound weights. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to do body weight today. You know, I'm going to go to the track. And so the CEO said, can you recreate those types of re- workouts that you do for yourself and for all these celebrities and do it in front of a television? I said, you know, add a pull-up bar and some bands and some dumbbells. Because I was always trying to work on their weaknesses as much as their strengths just to keep them interested. You know what I mean? And keep them from getting hurt and, and seeing results over time. So he came up with muscle confusion. And it, it kind of it, describes what we were doing. It's a good thing. And, and one other thing I've, I've got to give you credit for, uh, I just wrote you know, a, a chapter in, in my last book on biohacking about you know, putting on muscle and all the different technologies that work better than picking up rocks, which is kind of what we're lifting is. We concentrate in the rocks now. Uh, <laughs> and one of them is bands because the type of resistance that a band gives your body is foreign and it actually confuses your muscles. And mm-hmm. you, more than anyone else, have popularized bands and they are provably more efficient at building muscle than picking up weights. I'm not saying you should without, pick up without weights. Without injury. Yeah. Yeah, without injury yeah. too. Yeah. So, because so, the, 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 there's a better concentric mm-hmm. with bands than there are with dumbbells. Yeah. Nailed it. So it, it's it's cool. You've you've got some things that I would I would label early biohacks that you evolved into because you did all sorts of things and, and all this. Mm. Um what about hormones though? I mean do you measure your hormones? Do you, do you know your testosterone levels? I do. I know my testosterone and my free testosterone. I mean, I, I get my blood work. I just did it last week and I'll probably sit down with my endocrinologist slash nutritionist and we'll talk about those numbers. And my test, I don't take anything for it. I don't. I was going to ask no you that next. Yeah. And they're, it's between 780 and I've gotten as high as a thousand plus. And you can do that at 65, which it's so unusual because we have an epidemic even in no, she keeps young saying men. It's like you sure you're not taking anything at all, man yeah protein powder twice a day and training hard yeah and recovery you know getting enough quality protein helps so much the right fats and i i managed to get mine up to 750 i've been on testosterone since i was 26 i had lower mm. testosterone than my mom uh, and i was oh, wow. really unhealthy i had you know mold toxins that were estrogenic and you know mm-hmm. a lot of problems so I went off of it for about three years when I was testing out my first big diet book just to see what I could do. And if I did everything perfect, I could get to 750, but I feel much better at nine. And so mm. I supplement, I, I inject once a week and I keep my doses around nine or my levels around 900 mm. and it works. And I, I just encourage everyone listening, man or woman, if you don't know your sex hormone levels, no matter your age, you're just missing out. It's cheap to get it done now. You can do it at home and then yeah. you know your baseline and you know if what you're doing works because you know, if you're eating, you know, the, the Cheetos and Diet Coke uh, vegan diet, which some people do, well, I'm vegan, I must be healthy. Your testosterone <laughs> is going to be in the shitter. And then <laughs> you'll know. And then you can say, well, maybe what I'm doing doesn't work. And maybe they'll add some more protein or they'll get better sleep or the things you're talking about. But mm. I'm so impressed. Most guys at 65, even with a great regimen, what they experience is that the stuff that worked two years ago just doesn't work no matter how they push harder, but the mm. muscle won't grow. And it's the andropause thing. And so you're whatever the combination of meditation and sleep and work and exercise or happiness and community, whatever you're doing, you're a far outlier to have levels that high because most 30-year-olds don't have levels like you do. I know. It's bizarre. And I am an outlier. I suppose I am an anomaly in that respect. But I mean, keep in mind, 
except for being sick with Ramsey Hunt and travel, I haven't missed a workout in 35 years. I mean, when I first started climbing, when I was P90X guy, I couldn't climb a 15 foot rope. It's like, oh, ow, ow, it hurts my hands. <laughs> you know, like, oh, my, mm -hmm. my forearms are pumping up. I can't even open my hand. Right. And so I went, oh, okay, I'm terrible at this. Let's keep doing it. Let's, let's get away from the weights a little bit and start climbing some ropes. And then I went, you know, I had a pegboard in, in, in junior high school and I couldn't put this, I couldn't pull one out without crashing. So I went, I got made two of them. I got two of them on my property and I, and none of us could do them. We were all terrible because it was just a completely different movement. But I mean, it's more muscle confusion, right? Now, mm -hmm. now we go, I go around the pegboard like I'm on the moon, you know, only because 17 years later, doing it twice a week, mixed in with all the other things that I do, I'm just, I just, you know, oh, I can, we can go to the top. Let's see if we can go to the corner. Let's see if we can go to the corner and down. Let's see if we can go to the corner down and here. And then we go up, over, down, and back. You know what I mean? And I sing the national anthem when I do it just to be a wise guy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and it's, it, and I'm older. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, I got this pegboard 17 years ago and I can do it better than ever. I mean, all that behavior, plus the recovery, plus, plus the infrared song up, you know, plus the foam rolling, plus the, those naps and the meditation. And, and I don't have kids. I mean, you know, a lot of my friends have kids. They have like, there's a bunch of extra energy in the house that kind of sucks their life out of them sometimes. Makes it harder for oh, them. That's why your testosterone is so high because you don't have kids, so you yeah. have a life of quiet luxury. I, I see what you're doing there, Tony. <laughs> yes. All right, I, I, that, my pendulum swings very far in both directions, man. I like when it comes to chilling and relaxing and hanging out underneath the awning and and you know just enjoying some lemonade. I, I love it. I'm sleeping in. Sign me up. You know what I mean? I, I know what I need it, so I do it. I'm not afraid. I don't judge the fact that sometimes I'm just effing off. You know what I mean? I understand how my body's reacting to that. Yeah, and then you, you change what you're doing for that day, which is what everyone can aspire to. Is just, oh, you know, mm. it's not that I'm feeling lazy, it's that something's not working right. But sometimes yeah. you are feeling lazy. And, and to just learn the discernment between those two states has yeah. been really important. And yeah. there's a lot of shame out there too. I, I talk about how I, I want to get exactly the right amount of exercise to feel and look a certain way. Um, but I'm also really busy with multiple companies and, you know, writing books and all that stuff. So some people are like, well, you're just not willing to work hard. And, and I'm just like, should we compare abs? Because, you know, I'm 8% body fat and I'm, you know, probably can crush you in my grip. So it, it's like, I'm super willing to work hard, but I'm going to work hard to feel amazing and to do the things that right. matter. And it, it seems like you've gotten to that as well. We're like, today isn't the day to push really hard. Today's the day to recover hard. And then push harder tomorrow, and and as a guy that works, but the the new program, the Power Sync sixty, um, that you launched specifically around a woman's cycle, we know, and certainly I know from the the fertility book and the books on biohacking with the chapters on on what women's hormones do, you get a testosterone boost around days eleven to fifteen. Correct. And that not only makes it so that you can build muscle more quickly then and you want to go to the gym, it also turns tends to turn up libido. And mo that's Mother Nature doing it on purpose to try and get mm -hmm. you pregnant, right? right. Like she's always right. trying to trick men and women to have babies even if we don't want to, right? right? So you're, you're saying, well, let's put some of that testosterone energy into going to the gym, eating more protein, or not just going to the gym, but you know, doing the specific exercises that you designed in Power Sing 60 um, so that you get the right signal when you have the ability to respond to it. And that that's scientifically validated. You talk about the research um, on your site. It's also just, it makes sense from a biohacking perspective that that's why the body is doing that. And you can also look at times when estrogen and progesterone levels drop. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, that's when you're likely to be tired. That's towards the end of a menstrual cycle. And, and that's when you should be doing, you know, simple yoga or, or just a yeah. simple stretch routine or just s sitting in a chair and, and doing some box breathing. And that's all in the program, too. So that, that's all like being kind to yourself. So I, I love it that you incorporated that because, I mean, stereotypically, if, if we didn't have this interview or someone just looked at an old P90X video, like Tony's never going to Don't tell you about box that breathing. Meathead. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and so right. I, I really like this because leaning in, uh, the Sheryl Sandberg style and pushing hard and grit, there's a time for that. And if you're unable to do it, you're weak. But man, if you do it at the wrong time, you're dumb. And yeah. 
or maybe just misinformed. And, and so I, 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 I would say yeah. misinformed. And, yeah. and here's what's interesting too, a little after effect from listening to the two beta groups, couples are getting along better than ever because the women now have some, some information, some real science. Hey, honey, here's why I have to do this this way. And, you know, and a lot of, a lot of gals, they just kind of, you know, they're winging it too. They're, you know, it's not like, you know, they have a degree in kinesiology or, or women's fitness. We all do our best, right? We do our best, right? Based on what we know and what we've learned. And because of this program, you know, this one woman who's in her 70s says, my husband was like, oh my God, I can't believe you're going to do another program. You keep wasting your time. Nothing ever works. And she, she explained to him why she felt this was different, even though she didn't maybe have all the information, but she was just listening to a podcast with Mindy and I like this. And he's like, all right, all right. And so she then, you know, she wanted to lose 10 pounds. She lost 15, which was surprising. She didn't even know she had 15 to lose. And she's just, she goes, I just feel better. I, I'm, I'm not sore all the time. I'm not exhausted all the time. When the stop option comes and there's more workout, I stop there. And that means I have the energy to come back the next day. And my husband finally is, finally gets it. Like he understands why I'm doing this thing and why, why it's important for us as a couple. You know what I mean? And so she goes, my relationship's yeah. never been better. Like, oh, holy crap. Like that happened too, you know? I absolutely believe it. And, and there's, there's a group of couples out there. I don't know what percentage it is, uh, but I, I've done a lot, of, uh, a lot of work on personal development because of my neuroscience company, non-relationships, and just I, I'm a constant learner. So mm. what's happening is in, in these couples, one of the partners or both believes that if their partner is attractive, that it that it's a threat because they might lose their partner, right? So there's these subtle and unconscious sabotages that happen. Mm. And what I learned from John Gray, the the Mars and Venus guy, who's sure. a, who's a friend, yeah. uh, he talks a lot about hormones and relationships. And it turns out that you've got to do the deep work if if you or your partner like punishing you for being fit, like you know you, you need to call them out on that, and it's time for some therapy or whatever. Uh, but if that's not going on, when a woman starts exercising this way in alignment with her hormones, it's likely that her moods will change, right? Same with a guy. You start exercising, your moods will change too. But when you do it sustainably, not just for a week or two, but if you do it for two or three months, your partner is going to start looking Noticing. at you differently. <laughs> yeah, they might notice it at first, but they're like the picture of the way that, that you look at another human being, it isn't what they just did. It's the sum of the last seven years of knowing them. That's why you always think your kids are younger than they are. And mm -hmm. it's more loaded towards the recent stuff. So even your, your, your wife, who loves you dearly and has been with you forever, she sees a mix of you over the last few years, no matter how good you are right now. Mm -hmm. But when you create a dramatic change for about three months, it's going to affect that picture. And all of a sudden, your partner's view of you, not just how you look, but how you act and who you are, it can shift and it can be really powerful. And it is through hormonal manipulation, which changes how you behave towards others. So it's a cool hack. I, I like that you've gone in this direction. Well, thank you, man. You know, we're all, we, we gravitate to people who are happy and thoughtful and patient and funny and active. And, and if that's happening with your spouse, then there's a likelihood that you're just going to play and all get along better, especially if there's a shift, especially if there was a lot of, you know, a lot of drama in the, in, in your relationship before. And then this person sort of jumps, you know, jumps away from whatever negative behavior they were in the middle of and tried something new and it started, it starts to work. Then you're exactly right. The husband's going to notice that. And, and that creates a shift, an, an unexpected shift in him as well. Like he, that was never his intention, but geez, oh, my yeah. wife is phenomenal now. I, I better step up. And, it, the, and it makes, the, her behavior yeah. makes it easier for him to behave better. You nailed it. And, and this is not really politically correct, but men's biology follows women's biology. So if there is a, a fertile or healthy and vibrant woman around you, ideally your spouse, but even if it's just you know a waitress in a restaurant, your invisible meat operating system picks it up and goes, oh, maybe I can make a baby. And your testosterone levels go up. So when your partner is healthy, it drives your testosterone levels up as a guy, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and that changes your behavior towards your spouse. And so I really truly believe that hormonally directed exercise can help relationships. And even if you're not the one doing it, it can help your relationship and maybe you'll both do it. And yeah. 
it's profound all the invisible stuff that happens between uh, humans during you know mating and all of our hormonal behaviors and stuff. I think we're going to see a lot from AI that teaches us things that that we kind of intuited, but the data is there, the chemical signaling is there, and mm. you make either partner healthier, they will drag the other one along. Uh, yeah. But I think that a woman's health will drive a man's health more than a man's health will drive. I agree health. with you 100% on that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my wife, when we met, you know, she was a, a model. She was stick skinny. She was miserable. Salads in the elliptical, you know what I mean? Uh, and cigarettes. That was it. Cigarette salads in the elliptical just to keep that 109 pounds on her, her five foot nine height. And she was incredibly unhappy. And then, she, you know, she left because it was just too brutal. And then we met and she was, you know, periodically trying to stay fit, especially when she met me, like, oh, I better step up. But it just wasn't in her nature. It was new to her. And at first, I, you know, I was treating her like I was her dad, not her, not her partner. And yeah. that doesn't work for the relationship. No. And I went, I love this woman for so many other reasons, other than the fact that she's not the fittest person in the world, even though that, that's kind of important to me. But she's just so amazing. I'm going to let her find her own way at her own time. And here it is, whatever, 16 years in our relationship. And she so appreciates that I'm just leaving her alone and letting her do it her way and letting her discover it her way, which is not my nature, Dave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I just love her too much to be a pain in her ass. You, you know what I mean? And so it's not your job. If you make it your job, you're not going to have a healthy, a healthy relationship. So exactly. yeah. So right all now she's with Power Sync 60, she's doing the program. And she, you know, she's got back issues from an, a, a jet ski accident years ago. But it's just really fun. And I'm just, I'm not saying anything, man. I'm just taking it in and watching her. And I'm so proud of her. She's such a badass now. And, you know, she, she runs my life. I mean, I'd wander off into the woods if it wasn't for my wife. And that's how amazing she is. So I feel very, <laughs> very blessed. And it's just fun to see her come around. Like everybody, people say, well, my brother, my sister, my uncle, my mom, how can I help them? Not until they ask. Worst kind of advice to give is the kind that's never been asked for in the first place, you know? So that's yeah. a lesson that not everybody's learned yet. That's a fair point. Well, hopefully we're sharing some good knowledge here for people. I think so. I want to ask you about entrepreneurship. I mean, we've, we've both started sizable companies. Uh, what was your biggest challenge? Uh, you know, I, I've certainly gone through a lot, but, but was it fame? Was it money? Was it getting funded? Was it you know, bad employees? Like what, what are the things that really were hard? Well, all of those, I've been through that. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of my list. Um, you know, when I, when I was a nobody running around town training celebrities, that was kind of cool, but it wasn't making me any money really because I, I didn't have a financial advisor. So, you know, when you're doing mime at the pier and you're waiting tables and you're a go-go dancer at Chippendales, you know what I mean, and you're building tables and doing whatever you need to do in your hand to mouth, you know, you don't know better because you're in California and it's different than Connecticut and it seems pretty cool. And then like stage two is, oh, I'm training Bruce Springsteen and, and Tom Petty and Billy Idol and Annie Lennox and Sean Connery and Shirley MacLaine. That's pretty cool. So we got a little bit more money. Um, but I didn't know how to manage my money. I, I wish I early on knew, knew not how to, to piss it away. And then, then of course, when Power 90 and P90X came along, you know, I was pulling a MC Hammer, Wesley Snipes bit where I'm just buying like seven, uh, $650 shirts at Barney's. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, a lot and, the for fame sure. thing, and the fame thing is, fame is kind of lame. It, uh, because it's nobody super knows. expensive energetically and it's super toxic spiritually. The people who are seeking fame, it's like, ah, you have no idea what you're asking for. Exactly. A lot of people are in it for all the wrong reasons. They're in it yeah. for the money and they're in it for the fame when it's really, it's really about helping people yeah. and then when these people come up to you being so thankful because you look at your house and your cars and your other house and you think you are the reason why i have this lifestyle so i stop for every picture i i take every selfie i'll have every conversation and it's fascinating and a lot of times when i, I met some kid at the logan airport um and you know when he's been in town he's going to come and hang out and work out with me and he seems uh, i don't know him. i mean i don't know him from a five-minute conversation at logan so I just get to meet really neat people. Yeah. I, I think for me is the 23 failed businesses. <laughs> like, oh, insoles, my own watch, my own mouth guard, my own TV shows, my own, you know, whatever. It was, and then there's lawyers involved in every one of those and lawyers aren't cheap. And then when they go, and I mean, I had, I had my own Tony Horton um, healthy food in 137 7-Elevens here in Southern California. You know how many 7-Elevens oh, are around the world? 
I was ready to buy my castle and feed my alligators in my moat. And then it all went to crap for a lot of reasons, like a lot of businesses do. These are expensive mistakes and they can really bring you down. But it doesn't mean you stop. You just keep on keeping on, you know. Yeah. So, your yeah. core practices of maintaining your energy w with exercise and food, that buys you the resilience to be able to handle failures like that. I mean, not all my businesses have succeeded in my career by a long shot. Mm. Uh, and, and some people look at you or they look at me and think, oh, everything you touch turns to gold. And someone asked me that once. And I'm like, do you know how many punches in the face I've taken to learn how to do this? Yeah. So it, I, I love that you're willing to talk about that because uh, it, it isn't particularly easy and, and it can be satisfying, but... I don't approach new opportunities like the same way I used to. You know what I mean? I would just ride an ugly wave. Like, you know, I would ignore all the all the signs and signals that said, you got to kill this thing. It's not going to work. Because, you know, you, you you want it so bad. You want the show. You know what I mean? The home delivery food. I want I want to be as big as Brendan Brazier. You know what I mean? You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it now I have I have four jobs and I, I'm I'm in talks with a couple more. And, you know, um, so far we're, we're doing all right. You know, we're doing all how right. many people work for you? I think it's 10 now. So these are 10 people all report to you directly or is this 10 across? No, all your they don't, they, only one of them reports to me directly. The rest, my wife handles the rest of them. I get in on the meetings and I, you know, I, I have my, my ear to the wall to find out what's going on. But I, sure. I there's just too much other stuff to go on to get in the minutia of, you know, like an Instagram post or something. I can't. It, it's hard to uh, to be the talent which you are, and, and I am as well, and a CEO. And yeah, I I pull it off, but it means you got to have people you trust, uh, because yeah. just being a CEO is enough work. And yeah. you know, then getting behind a camera with half your time, like, like how do you do that? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm in front of a camera all, all the time. I'm a pretty upbeat guy. The, the guy that you see now, the guy you see in Pianetics, it's the same guy. You know what I mean? It's because of what I eat and how I do, and when I meditate, and blah blah blah. And I, you know, I was always this guy. But still, you know, when you got to hit your mark and do your thing, that takes a certain amount of energy. Oh, no time for a camera. It's like, yeah. oh, God, I don't want to do this. Hey, everybody, Tony Horton here, fired up. You know why? Because I'm going to share with you something so special, so good. going to change your life. Are you ready? Let's giddy up. Let's go. You know what I mean? I got to turn that guy on and cut. Oh, okay, good. And then mm -hmm. go home. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes, it's, some days it's easy. Some days it's, it's not. And you just got to do it anyway because it pays the bills. So it's, it's and and you got to be, and, and I got to be thankful for, for all of it because I feel blessed that I'm in this position. You know, I, I realize, and, and thanks to uh, the online audience, guys, you can just go to DaveAsprey.com. You can become an online audience member and be here. Um, but uh, Meg says, what about perimenopausal or postmenopausal women? We talked about women who are cycling. How does your program work if you know, your hormones are different each month or if you're not cycling anymore? Is, is it still appropriate? And what are the changes you had to make? Um, Dr. Mindy would be better at answering that question, but, but I have a general sense of what, what you do. Okay. So that group of women would probably start on day one of calendar one, month one. Others that are still going having menopause would probably start on day seven, somewhere between day seven, 11, or 15. And so what you would do is you have different start dates, which would put you through a certain different cycle. And for example, certain women, whether they're menopausal, perimenopausal, or postmenopausal, would be doing the entire workout. Others would be hitting the first stop option. Others would be doing the power down version or the power up version. So there's a, there's a questionnaire in there to kind of check who you are and where you are, whether, you, whether you're going, having a cycle or not. Men have one calendar. This is it, dudes. You know I mean? it's 11, 11 workouts. We're going to sprinkle them around two months. There's different groups of women have different calendars that they would follow based on what. what okay, so basically the questionnaire helps to make recommendations for where you yes. are. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, beautiful. I, I know we're up at the end of the show. Uh, thank you for your work in the world, helping people be healthy. And most importantly, Tony, thanks for evolving. Uh, I can see just the, the wisdom and humility that, that you've grown through hard work. And I think it's coming through in, in what you're offering uh, for women and what you're offering just for all humans. So I, I appreciate it. David, I've really thoroughly enjoyed this today, man. I can see why your fan base is so massive. You know, you're, you're a man who wears many hats, who's obviously very curious as well. And, and what you've done and 
so far to help people and you'll continue to do is is impressive man so yeah thank you for having me on i was a little nervous i'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie to you you know so, uh, so I'm, I'm not mean to people even you know if, if we agree or don't agree <laughs> what if it he asks me a question i don't know the answer what will i do yeah. Um, and also, quick shout out to Joe Polish, who's been on the show talking about things. I think uh, you're pretty Joe's, close with Joe, Joe's right? Awesome, man. He's, he's, a, awesome. he's a dear friend as well, and he's he's been yeah. telling me for years I need to have you on the show. So there you go, Joe Polish. I did it. So thank you, Joe. <laughs> Thanks for introducing Dave and I. It's been, been all right. Been time. You're listening to the Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. 